you, you hear some of the things I do. I travel and I dress up in costumes of people and I consult for film projects and write books and so on and I, I have a very fortunate life. And my, my, I remember my grandmother from Fergus Falls, Minnesota, who was a dairy farmer. And when she sort of saw the profile of my life, she said, I see you've chosen a path of no heavy lifting. Uh, <laughs> And, and so I've had this life of no heavy lifting. I get to read for a living. I get to talk. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, it's a very, it's a very lovely sort of life. It's a bit hand to mouth, you know, because it's not, it's not a long-term institutional existence. It's, it's not the sort of a life that a, perhaps a, a traditional faculty member would have. But here's what's missing, and it's going to sound a little odd. It's a little lonely. It's a little lonely, and I don't just mean for me, but it's a little lonely in North Dakota because the, the, the energy boom and the, the new vibrancy in North Dakota has been so compelling. It's one of the most compelling things that ever happened. It's, it's this, this moment in North Dakota's history may be the most important story in the history of North Dakota. And because it's so compelling, the legislature needs to think about it all the time, and every institution needs to be thinking about it all the time. Institutions like this have meetings trying to figure out how to position themselves to be useful to this moment and to help clarify it and so on. And, and all of that is great, but it, there are things that it drives out, and a certain quiet, conversational exploration of life and ideas and, and the life of the spirit it doesn't go necessarily to the back burner, but it has a harder time keeping to the center of our discourse. And so I feel a little lonely, and I think the University of Mary is doing some very remarkable things that there's a real, there's, a, there's something happening here that you all know, and I'm just delighted to be part of it. And so I come here seeking new friendships and um, ways to, um, to have a conversation about some things that are less easy to have a conversation with. I, need, I mean no disrespect to anybody, but when I moved back here in, 10 years ago, uh, I bought a house in, up near Horizon Middle School, and I moved myself from Reno, Nevada, and uh, that was probably a mistake. Um, it took four of, four of the largest U-Hauls you can rent without the special license. And so I was doing these ridiculous trips back and forth, and the, the fourth and final U-Haul, this giant U-Haul, contained nothing but books. And so that, literally, there wasn't a box of Kleenex in it, it was just books. And my neighbor was this, one, this wonderful guy, he's a friend of mine, he came over and he, he stood, I'd never met him before, and he stood watching people haul these boxes into my new house, and, and he finally said, what, what is this? What? What are, what are they moving there? And I said, oh, it's my books. And he looked at me and he said, well, well I don't read. And I said, you mean you don't have a lot of time to read Dante's Inferno? <laughs> and he said, no, I, I don't read. And I thought, well, this is gonna be interesting, you know, because he, he already regards me as some sort of pathetic geek. <laughs> and we've become very close neighborly friends, but it just struck me that I might have, I might have brought the wrong kind of baggage. Um, so I went out and bought a jet ski, and <laughs> now he teaches me how to tune it up, and so things are better. But it's just... Um, so there's that, there's, there's this, I want this conversation, and I think Bismarck is becoming, it was, it was a great place, but, it's be, but it always sort of had this kind of not quite Fargo, not quite NDSU feel to it, you know, that, that we're made to feel quite often by people from the eastern part of the state. And now Bismarck is going to become a very important regional city, I think. And it's growing. You see the diversity. You see the new shops, the new restaurants, the new building. It's really, this, this is going to be a remarkable time. And in a certain sense, North Dakota is going to be the sweet spot of this great development. And so the people who come here are going to call for more. You know, they're going to want more. 
and they're going to help us get more. And it's going to really, th I think it's really going to transform this place. I think there are growing pains to be sure, and there are parts of this that frighten me, but, but some parts of it are really going to make North Dakota, um, uh, um, the, the challenge is to allow North Dakota to become this thing that it's going to become without losing the deep agrarian character of the state that is so important to us. And I think the leader who can show us how to do that is going to be the great leader of our time. And I think we need that leader. We need, we need to stay deeply rooted in our agrarian past and in the Benedictine sisters and in the prairie character of this place that allowed us to tough it out decade after decade after decade against almost impossible odds. But we also need to embrace this new diversity and the new possibilities and um, types of citizens that we are not used to seeing here. So I think this calls for great leadership. And I don't have any uh, disrespect for any of the current leaders, but I think we're going to have to grow more. We're going to have to grow more. And I think a lot of them are going to be the young people in this room. So I think when, when the University of Mary dedicates itself to being a the nation's leadership university, that's a wonderful thing to do. So I want to talk just for a minute today about that, but before I do, I want to say something about Rome. When, when Monsignor Shea asked me to become involved with the university, he said, what would you like to do? And I said, whatever else I do, I'd like to go to Rome. And he said, okay, so this fall I had three weeks, some of the students are here, I'm really glad to see them. I had three weeks teaching a capstone course for the Rome experience, and then I just got back from a week in Rome, and I'll be going back over Easter. I just want to say a word about it. it. This program is one of the great things that the University of Mary has ever done. I, t my role is to take the students to places that they might not otherwise see while they're there. And so last week I took them to the Appian Way, to the, the, the great first highway. The Romans were fabulous engineers, and they built some of the greatest roads ever. And some of the roads that they built are still being used around the world. And they weren't just roads. They, they understood engineering. And if you look at the cross section of them, they would excavate and do borrow ditches and put down gravel and then put down other layers and another form of gravel and then concrete and then flagstones. And they built roads to last. Um, I think the, the roads that they built hold up better than our national highways because they built them forever. And so we walked out on the Appian Way and it was just a perfect um, early spring evening in Rome and the students, were, you could see them understanding that they were, you know, the, what's the oldest street in North Dakota? Uh, you know, I don't, what's the oldest street in Bismarck? The mayor probably knows, but but they're on a road that's 3,000 years old and it still holds up. And you can see their eyes opening to this. In the fall, one of the students took me to um, a Jesuit church and he, he, he's not a Catholic, he's, um, he's, he's a Lutheran. He was the only non-Catholic student in the bunch. And when we got in the church, he started explaining the Baroque architecture and the paintings. And he, he, had, he, had, he had never taken an art history course in his life He's from Mandan, North Dakota. He had never taken an art history course in his life, and now he is explaining in a wonderful and nuanced and creative way the art and architecture of a famous Roman Jesuit church. It was just the way that these young people's eyes are opening. And I would be leaving campus on my own one day, and, and, and I'd say, I think I'll do this. And they'd say, no, no, you mustn't take the 870. You must take the 31, and then you get the tram. And, and they're experts. They know, how to, they know how to use a subway. They know, know how to do buses. They know how to fly on their own to other cities. Uh, I would say, well, I'm going to go get gelato. And they'd say, oh, don't go there. That would be such a mistake. And then they, they have some place that you've never heard of. And it's just to see them master one of the world's great cities and also to learn as much as they are learning. It transforms them. And when they come back here, they're, they're never going to be quite the same person that they were when we sent them. And several of the students that I was able to work with in the fall had gone to Rome and it had been their first flight ever. Think of this, to leave Bismarck International <laughs> at five in the, in the morning and wind up in Rome at eight o'clock the next morning. Um, it's a spectacular achievement for the University of Mary and I'm just so thrilled to have 
any um, any part of it whatsoever. And I'm uh, the only part that I that I didn't like was that Tom Schultzenberg, who's the wonderful um, director of the program there, before I left. Um, I sent him a letter saying, if there's anything you'd like me to bring in my luggage, I'd be happy to, you know, to bring anything you might want. And so he sent me an alphabetized list by category, <laughs> uh, and beginning with cheddar cheese. And so, you know, they have cheeses great in, in Europe, but cheddar is not one of their cheeses. And so I, I felt like I was a Mexican drug lord. <laughs> I went, I went to Target and bought like seven blocks of cheddar, <laughs> and I had them, and I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's illegal, but, <laughs> but I was on the plane, I tried to think of what my excuse would be, because imagine if you stop by customs in Rome, and they say, you appear to have 16 and a half pounds of cheddar cheese. <laughs> if you say, I have friends here who miss cheddar, you're going to spend the rest of your life in a Turkish prison. I mean, that's a, that sounds like ISIS to me, you know. What, oh, so it looks like cheddar, does it? And so I told him never again that, um, and he, then this time he said he wanted me to bring powdered sugar, and I said, absolutely not, you know. <laughs> no. No powdered sugar, Tom. It, it was just a, a spectacular experience. So leadership, just let me say a few words and then I want to have plenty of time for your thoughts and questions, but, but I've been thinking about it because there's so many different varieties of leadership. And I think one of the mistakes we make is thinking that there is a leadership style. I don't think that's true. I think that many different personality types and many different styles and many different background types can produce great leadership. And so just to take one quick uh, swipe at this, if you have a spectrum, if you have Someone, a big over-the-top personality like Lyndon Johnson or Bill Clinton or Theodore Roosevelt at one end of the spectrum. Just the kind of people that come in the room and they overpower you and they lean right into you and they get in your space and they either take your lapel or they, you know, you, you can, you can, they, get, they get too close so you get uncomfortable about their invasion of your personal sovereign space. That's one very distinguished type of leadership. Bill Clinton had it in in a remarkable degree, and so did Lyndon Johnson, so did Theodore Roosevelt. At the other end of the spectrum, there is the sort of quiet uh, leader, like Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson would never invade another person's space. He would never raise his voice. He would never say, you will do this, or I want you to do that. It was very quiet. It's almost a Zen form of leadership. And I think, I think Mayor Warford was, was on that end of the spectrum. Not, not a big, boisterous, I'm here, glad-handing sort of leader, but quiet, extremely competent, always, always on top of the material, uh, more likely to listen than to bloviate. Um, I, I interview, I'm doing this series of, of interviews called the Dakota Interviews, and I'm doing them at Bismarck State, and I'm interviewing 100 North Dakotans uh, for three hours each on video. So that's a long interview. And every time I ask someone to do it, they say, what do I have to talk about for three hours? And then at the end of the three hours, they say, can we, can we, can we keep going? Can we keep going? Because people want to tell their stories, and people want to talk about the future of this state. And one of the first interviews that I did was Mayor Dennis Johnson of Dickinson. And, and there is an example of the, of the quieter brand of leader. He, he virtually whispers, um, and yet he's been He's, almost everybody believes that he's handled the Bakken oil boom as well as any leader in that whole zone has done it. And so I asked him about leadership, and he was, of course, because he is so quiet, he doesn't want to talk about himself, which is why he's in part a great leader. But he said, I'll tell you what, I'm an introvert. I'd rather be at the back of the room than in the front of the room. I'd rather give a speech than be at a cocktail party. I'd rather listen than speak. He said, I'm an introvert, but, an, and I, he said, but it hasn't hurt me. An introvert can do everything that an extrovert can do, but he has to try twice as hard. And he said, that's the key to m my leadership. And so there's one end. So you have, you have that, that sort of Jeffersonian, quieter style, and then you have the big, the big boisterous style. And I, I want to just pause for a minute to look at Martin Luther King. Um, one of, the, I think, the greatest 
leadership moments in American history uh, was Martin Luther King's career from Selma. You, you just saw the commemoration of Selma this last week. It inspired in the current president one of his best speeches. And then it culminated in the assassination of Martin Luther King in the spring of, of 1968. But in 1963, the speech that's, that's most often quoted, maybe one of the top five speeches quoted ever in American history is his I Have a Dream speech, which, which he gave in Washington, D.C. on the Mall on August 28th. So imagine the heat. If you've been to Washington in August or September, the heat and the humidity, and the kind of the sweltering, oppressive sense he gave one of the great speeches uh, in American history there, and, and he used a metaphor. That, so these metaphors tend to always go back to Thomas Jefferson. So in, in 1776, Jefferson said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that's probably the most important secular sentence ever uttered in the United States. 37 words, Jefferson, this supreme literary craftsman, shy, couldn't make eye contact, preferred to be alone in a room, hated a cocktail party. 37 words, he found 37 words which have become amongst the most important words ever written. So students, take your writing courses seriously, <laughs> because words matter in such a big way even now. And American history can be seen as a series of returns to that sentence to try to figure out, well, what does it mean? What does it demand of us? Have we, have we fulfilled it? Is there more that we need to do? So every time there is a, a, a significant leap forward in the human rights tradition, it tends to go back to that sentence by Jefferson. Lincoln, for example, is a, and I'll come back to Lincoln before I'm done. Lincoln said in a series of speeches and letters before he became the President of the United States, he said, well, we don't quite know what Jefferson meant when he wrote that all men are created equal. He said he was a southern planter, he had slaves, he probably he probably didn't mean it in the fullest possible sense. But, said Lincoln, we can't go on as a nation unless we read it in the fullest possible sense. In a certain sense, it no longer matters what Jefferson quite meant by it or if his own life is not up to those standards. He wrote this universal statement about human liberty and human freedom and human dignity, and we can't go on as a nation unless we now embrace it in its fullest, most universal sense. And so, even though Lincoln was not really anti-slavery, and the fact is Lincoln was, in some respects, a racist, he believed that black people and white people should probably not mingle together in the social sphere. And at one time, he supported repatriation efforts to, to possibly take freed blacks to Africa. He was uneasy about full social equality, let's put it that way. But in the course of his presidency, Lincoln realized we can't go on now unless we free the slaves. That this, this 860,000 people killed over states' rights and, and uh, regional disputes, we, we will not be able to go on as a nation unless we do the right thing here and free the slaves. For which, arguably, he paid his life. So now go forward to Martin Luther King, 100 years later. Martin Luther King is an African-American civil rights leader at a time when we still have Jim Crow laws, when there are still poll taxes, when there are literacy tests, when blacks are beaten up for marching with, uh, in, in communities like Selma, when there are um, bathrooms for white people and bath bathrooms for coloreds. I mean, when we still have effective apartheid all over the United States, and deep personal and structural racism in the country. And so now Martin Luther King, this charismatic leader, goes to the Washington Mall, and he said this, and I find this so, I find this, this, this I know we all love the I Have a Dream sequence. He, he said one of the greatest sentences in American history. He said that we will have, 
achieved our dreams when we judge a man by the content of his character rather than the color of his skin. And almost all of us know that phrase, and it's perfect. We will judge a person by the content of his character rather than the color of his skin. But this is what he said. It's a metaphor. He said early on, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital today to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men, as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. So think of the metaphor. The words, all men are created equal, are a, a check, the kind you'd, you'd write in a grocery store. It's a promissory note. And Martin Luther King says, every time we Negroes take that check to the bank of American justice, they turn us away for insufficient funds. Then he says, but we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe uh, that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. So here's what he's saying, and it makes me burst into tears every time I think about it. He's saying, for 200 years, this ideal has been dangled in front of the whole American people. And we Negroes have taken this to the bank of justice over and over again. And every time we do, you reject the check and say there are insufficient funds. And then he says, we are going to take the check to the bank of justice and this time you are going to cash it. Think of this. This time you are going to cash it. Because why? If you don't, you're, you're pathetic hypocrites. You've, this is who you are. This is, he was appealing to America at its best. He was saying, this is the best of America. And you are denying the very thing you most pride yourself on to a people <coughs> for no reason. So here's my definition of leadership. Leadership is bringing us to do what we know we need to do, but we weren't going to do it without the leader getting us there. Does that make sense? So we all know that there are certain things we need to do as a people. For example, now, we need to figure out what to do about immigration reform. What we're going to do with the 12 to 20 million uh, illegals who live here what we're going to do about our border, how we're going to determine citizenship, how we're going to make sure national security is, um, is protected, how we're going to differentiate between honest people who have been waiting in line for six years to get in, or 16 years, and then those who just crossed the border. This is a huge set of problems, and I'm not interested in the politics of it. But we, as a great nation, are going to have to face this, and so some leader is going to have to rise, or a set of leaders, who are going to help us do the thing we have to do even though we might not ourselves be able to do it. But that's what a leader is. The mayor performed this. I've seen it again and again in the course of his time here in Bismarck. That, that's what great leadership is. And so there are many styles of this. I want to just give you two, and then I'll, and then I'll turn to you for your questions. Roosevelt v. v. Jefferson. Jefferson lived exactly 100 years before Theodore Roosevelt. He was, he was inaugurated president on March 4, 1801. He was the third president. And Roosevelt became president, thanks to the assassination of uh, William McKinley, uh, in 1901. So they're exactly 100 years apart. They could not have been more different if they had tried. Um, Jefferson never raised his voice. Uh, he was never visibly angry. He was never, he never shot a pistol. Uh, when he rode a horse, somebody else had saddled it for him and groomed it for him. It was more like British horse-style riding than the kind we associate with John Wayne. Jefferson was unendingly civil. He never threatened anyone. 
Uh, Jefferson was happiest alone in a room with a sheet of paper and the English language. He, he, he didn't like to be out amongst people. Roosevelt was as exuberant a person who has, who has ever lived. He always, his daughter, Alice, said of her father, the famous Alice Roosevelt said, my father wanted to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt had to be the center of attention. He couldn't, he, he was the 26th president. FDR was his fifth cousin, but Eleanor, FDR's wife, was his niece. So Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's niece, Eleanor, marries her cousin, fifth, and TR's fifth cousin. And Roosevelt, the president, presided over the wedding in New York City, and nobody paid any attention to the bride and groom because Roosevelt was holding forth and working the crowd, and he set the record for shaking the most number of hands on a single day. It held up till the 1970s. He was just, when I perform as Theodore Roosevelt, I perform as Jefferson and perform as Roosevelt. When I'm done performing Jefferson, I just want to go and, you know, do something rational. And when I perform as Roosevelt, at the end, I'm just sopping wet and exhausted and <laughs> sick of him and sick of me. And <laughs> it's just one of the people who met him who loved him and said, he said, he left the White House and went off to a, the Willard Hotel in Washington and someone said, how was it? And he said, it was great. Now I have to go wring his personality out of my clothes. <laughs> so you have these, and they're 100 years apart and they both did great things. Jefferson led us rationally, intelligently into the 19th century, and Roosevelt led us kicking and screaming into the 20th century. You know, imagine what it would have taken for Jefferson to send the great white fleet around the world. Roosevelt just did it. He sent the entire American Navy on a round the world friendship cruise. He had all of, he had the entire Navy painted white, all the ships. He sent every boat we had from Norfolk and Virginia around the world and back again. He was there when they left to salute them and he was there when they came back just a few days before his presidency ended. It was the largest circumnavigation in the history of the planet. It was flawless. He was trying to show that we were a big player in the world and that we could refuel and if there were breakdowns we could handle them and that we knew how to do ports of call and so on. It was a flawless circumnavigation of the planet. One of the great events in the history of America's rise to world power. And here's the most interesting thing about it. He did it without any congressional consultation of any sort. He not only didn't consult Congress, he didn't consult his cabinet. And when he was asked why he didn't consult his cabinet, he said, because they would have tried to talk me out of it. <laughs> and so he sent it, and so he, he sends it off. You know, when we think of how unhappy the opposition to the current president are about his executive orders. Imagine if, he had, if you had to deal with Roosevelt, sending the entire Navy somewhere. So a, a congressman from Ohio who was on the Senate Naval Affairs Committee came into the White House to complain. He got a meeting with Roosevelt and he said, this is, you, this, you shouldn't have done this, this is wrong, it's extra constitutional, you should be impeached. Went on and on and on and he said, and it's, it's the courtesy of presidents to consult the Naval Affairs Committee before they do anything of any sort. So Roosevelt listens dutifully, and then the, the, the man from Ohio, the senator, said, and I want to tell you, Mr. President, that I have consulted the budget, and there is not enough money in the naval budget to send the Navy on a round-the-world cruise. At this point, our Navy was in the Philippines. <laughs> and Roosevelt said, well, it's in the Philippines. If you want it back, I suppose you'll appropriate more money. Which they did, because they did want it back. <laughs> he just did it. He just did things like this. Uh, he, 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 Rose, Je, here's Jefferson's theory of power. Jefferson is a, is a Republican, small r Republican. He believed that our protection is having a written constitution that, that limits power, particularly the power of the individual. And so Jefferson read his presidency never to do anything that wasn't specifically enumerated in presidential powers in the Constitution. He even agonized over the Louisiana Purchase because he thought it was unconstitutional. He only did those things that he could point to a clause in the Constitution and say, it, it authorizes that. 
But when in doubt, Jefferson would back off and say, we can't do it. So for example, Lewis and Clark brought home this incredible treasury of artifacts, moccasins, beads, uh, the horns of bighorn sheep, um, teepees, um, saddles, bows and arrows. They brought back one of the world's great treasuries of artifacts from the American West, but there was no national museum. Jefferson was asked, Shouldn't, wouldn't this be a good time to create a national museum to house all this? And he said, no, that would be unconstitutional. If Congress wants to create one, they probably have to amend the Constitution to do it. And so now this set of treasures that would be the backbone of any Smithsonian anywhere were lost because Jefferson, there was no place to put them. And so today there are four or five things left from the Lewis and Clark expedition and everything else has been dispersed because we didn't have a national museum because Jefferson didn't believe that you could, con you know, if he'd just done it, I think history would have forgiven him. But Roosevelt would have built 10 of them. And, you know, without congressional author, he just would have done it. So let me just read two pieces for you and then I'll close. Uh, here's one on Roosevelt and here's one by Jefferson. As Jefferson was leaving the presidency in 1809, so he's elected in 1800, he begins in 1801, he, um, he voluntarily decides not to run for a third term in 1808, and he, he leaves in March of 1809. Jefferson would have been reelected to a third term and a fourth. Jefferson was an exceedingly popular and extremely able president, a brilliant administrator. Here's a letter that he wrote to one of his oldest friends, Samuel DuPont, who was a French philosopher. This is about March 1st, 1809, he, so he's got four more days in office. Within a few days, I retire to my family, my books, and farms. And having gained the harbor myself, I shall look on my friends still buffeting the storm with anxiety indeed, but not with envy. Never did a prisoner released from his chains feel such relief as I do on shaking off the shackles of power. Nature intended me for the tranquil pursuits of science by rendering them my supreme delight. But the enormities of the times in which I have lived have forced me to take a part in resisting them and to, com and to commit myself on the boisterous ocean of political passions. Think of that. Never has a prisoner released from his chains felt more relief than I do. Remember when Bill Clinton left? He stayed up, for, I mean, this is true. He stayed up, like, didn't sleep for the last two weeks because he didn't want to leave the presidency. We had to remove him with the jaws of life to get him out of there. He loved it so much. He, Roosevelt said, he, he said, I can promise you that no family has ever enjoyed living in the White House as much as we Roosevelt's have done. And I say no president will ever enjoy being president as much as I did. He, he would have stayed forever. If he could have figured out a way to subvert the Constitution, he would have just been president for life. And he tried again in 1912 because he left office and he realized, I can't live without power. But Jefferson quite happily could live without power. But they were both great leaders. They were great leaders for the times in which they lived. They had a way to read the times in which they lived. And both of them were extraordinary prose stylists. Now, Jefferson the greater. But Roosevelt's nothing to shake your head at. So I remember a number of years ago, the Eberts Ranch, part of the Elkhorn whole controversy out in the Badlands, it was finally obtained by the United States government under the U.S. Forest Service after a long, complex, and controversial set of negotiations. And there was a, there was a celebration of the acquisition of the Eberts Ranch because it's the view shed. When you're sitting at the Elkhorn cabin, that's what you see. And so this is what Roosevelt's historic ranch out there. There was a celebration, and they, we brought in the greatest living Roosevelt scholar, a man named Edmund Morris. Uh, he's written a three-volume masterful biography of Roosevelt. If you want to read one book on Roosevelt, read The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris. Won the Pulitzer <laughs> Prize. It's one of the great biographies of our time. And when he, um, when he came, they had the lecture, his little presentation of about 30 minutes in the amphitheater, and it was in, at 2 p.m. and it was 102 degrees. If you've ever been in the amphitheater, on a hot afternoon, it's like being in a bread oven. And so you have 200 or so people listening to the greatest living Roosevelt scholar, and he's South African, and he has a British accent, and he's kind of snooty. And he loves being, he, he wore a perfect suit, and he, he just, he looked like 
someone who had to be airlifted into North Dakota, but <laughs> who would have preferred not to come in in a vehicle. And, and he he's prides himself on being very, you know, Oxfordian. And he has a perfect, perfect South African British accent. And so he, he read a passage from Roosevelt, and I'm going to recite it for you. Uh, and then I'll tell you what he said. But listen to this. This is Roosevelt um, writing in his autobiography about his time here. So Roosevelt was a war hero. He was one of the great presidents in American history. He was a police commissioner of New York. He was US Civil Service Commissioner. He was the governor of New York. He traveled the world. He went on safari for a year. He, he explored an unknown river in South America. He had a big, big, big over-the-top life. But when he wrote his autobiography in 1913, he said that the fundamental experience of his life was here. In 1904, uh, the senator from New Mexico by the name of Albert Fall came to the White House and Roosevelt and he, they're both Westerners, both lovers of the frontier and, and President Roosevelt and Senator Fall are talking and Roosevelt said to him, well, if you, if, you could, if you could only have one experience of all the experiences of your life and everything else would disappear, you could only keep one, but anything else would disappear forever from your memory, what would you, what would you remember? It's an interesting question, isn't it? It can't be your family. It has to be something else. So what, what experience would you remember? Well, typically, Roosevelt didn't wait for, for poor Fall to answer. He just interrupted and gave his own answer. But he said, it would be my time as an authentic cowboy and rancher out in Dakota Territory. That was, the, that, was the, that was the formative and most important experience of my life. Think of that, of all the things he could have said. And he wasn't like talking to the Rotary Club of Fargo, where you, would, you, know, you might expect that kind of thing. He, he, talk, he said it in the privacy of the White House to a, to a New Mexican. All right, so in his autobiography, this is what he wrote. I just want you to listen to this. This is so great. He said, it was still the Wild West in those days. The West of Owen Wister's novels and Frederick Remington's paintings and sculpture. It was a land of vast open spaces. We led a free and hardy life with horse and rifle. We worked, we worked under the scorching midsummer sun when the wide plains wavered and shimmered in the heat. And we knew the freezing misery of riding night guard around the cattle during the late fall roundup. In the springtime, the stars shone glorious in our eyes each night before we fell asleep. And in the winter, we rode through blinding blizzards in which the driven snow dust burnt our faces. There were, to be sure, monotonous times when we walked the beef herds and trail cattle hour after hour at the slowest of paces and minutes or hours teeming with excitement as we stopped stampedes or drove the herds through rivers treacherous with quicksand or brimmed with running ice. We knew, to we knew toil and hardship and hunger and thirst. And we saw men die as they worked amongst the horses and cattle or fought in evil feuds with one another. But for all of this, we felt the beat of hearty life on our veins, and ours was the glory of work and the joy of living. Think of that. Theodore Roosevelt, about us, about North Dakota, about this place, the glory of work and the joy of living. So Edmund Morris read this out to us in this sweltering amphitheater. And then he had a long stage pause, and he looked up took his glasses off. He said, I wonder if you Yanks will ever produce another president who can write like that. We did not boo him. <laughs> it is true that Roosevelt was a great, great writer. It's a little snooty. Uh, but great writers make a big difference in the world. Um, if you can write, you know, Jefferson was not a great warrior. Um, he was not a man of great physical courage. He was not a man's man. You wouldn't see him in a pub. He never played billiards. Uh, but he could write like a million dollars, and, when, and he, could, he could synthesize the mood of the country.
And Roosevelt had the capacity to synthesize the mood of the country. And so there are just two um, extremely different styles of leadership, but they both have to do with being able to figure out what, you, what the world that you live in needs and how to encourage it to get there, even though it wasn't going to get there without you. Um, but you could proliferate. I mean, think of, think of the contrast in leadership styles between two great presidents of this institution, Sister Thomas and Monsignor Shea, both amazing leaders. They're quite different in style. So don't think that because you may not be a person who loves the cocktail party circuit or you're not a great orator or whatever that you can't be a leader. Leadership comes in so many flavors and it's, I think it's important to study varieties of leadership and to see where you might fit, but it comes from being able to read the culture. And we're at a moment now for the young people in this room, North Dakota is in desperate need, not just of people to drive trucks and not just people on the rigs and not just people in construction, all important and essential, but we are in desperate need of a new generation of leadership who will take us beautifully into the 21st century and that's what you're going to do and we're we're hoping we can help train you here. So thank you very much.